A very warm welcome to this online concert. We at St George's are really sorry that we can't meet with you personally yet again this year, but we're very happy to send this sequence of music and words to you. We hope very much that it will bring you and your families some Christmas joy, and we hope that it will remind you of the love of God revealed to us through the birth of Jesus Christ at Bethlehem. We wish you every blessing, you and your loved ones, for Christmas and the new year, and we hope very much indeed that we can see you in person again next year in St George's Chapel.
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth.
It was the very noon of night, the stars above the fold, more sure than clock or chiming bell, the hour of midnight told. When from the heavens there came a voice, and forms were seen to shine, still brightening as the music rose with light and love divine. With love divine, the song began, there shone a light serene. Oh, who hath heard what I have heard, or seen what I have seen? O oh, ne'er could nightingale at dawn salute the rising day with sweetness like that bird of song in his immortal lay. O oh, ne'er were wood notes heard at eve by banks with poplar shade so thrilling as the concert sweet by heavenly harpings made. For love divine was in each chord and filled each pause between. O oh, who hath heard what I have heard or seen what I have seen. I roused me at the piercing strain, but shrunk as from the ray of summer lightning, all around so bright the splendour lay. For oh, it mastered light and sense to see that glory shine, to hear that minstrel in the clouds who sang of love divine, to see that form with bird-like wings of more than mortal mean. O oh, who hath heard what I have heard, or seen what I have seen? When once the rapturous trance was past, that so my sense could bind, I left my sheep to him whose care breathed in the western wind. I left them, for instead of snow, I trod on blade and flower and ice dissolved in starry rays at morning's gracious hour, revealing where on earth the steps of love divine had been. Oh, who hath heard what I have heard, or seen what I have seen? I hastened to a low roof shed, for so the angel bade, and bowed before the lowly rack where love divine was laid, a newborn babe like tender lamb, with lion's strength there smiled. For lion's strength, immortal might, was in that newborn child. That love divine in childlike form had God forever been. O oh, who hath heard what I have heard, or seen what I have seen?
time was with most of us when Christmas Day, encircling all our limited world like a magic ring, left nothing out for us to miss or seek. Bound together all our home enjoyments, affections and hopes. Grouped everything and everyone around the Christmas fire and made the little picture shining in our bright young eyes complete. Time came, perhaps all so soon, when our thought overleaped that narrow boundary, when there was someone very dear, we thought then very beautiful and absolutely perfect, wanting to the fullness of our happiness, when we were wanting too, or we thought so, which did just as well, at the Christmas hearth by which that someone sat, and when we intertwined with every wreath and garland of our life, that's someone's name. That was the time for bright visionary Christmases, which have long arisen from us to show faintly after the summer rain in the palest edges of the rainbow. That was the time for the beatified enjoyment of the things that were to be and never were. And yet the things that were so real in our resolute hope that it would be hard to say, now what reality has achieved since have been stronger. What? Did that Christmas never really come when we and the priceless pearl, who was our young choice, were received after the happiest of totally impossible marriages by the two united families previously at daggers drawn on our account when brothers and sisters-in-law, who had always been rather cool to us before our relationship was affected, perfectly doted on us, and when fathers and mothers overwhelmed us with unlimited incomes. Was that Christmas dinner never really eaten, after which we arose and generously and eloquently honored to our late rival, present in the company, then and there, exchanging friendship and forgiveness and founding an attachment not to be surpassed in Greek or Roman story, which subsisted until death. Has that same rival long ceased to care for that same priceless pearl and married for money and become usurious? Above all, do we really know now that we should probably have been miserable if we had won and worn the pearl and that we are better without her. That Christmas, when we had recently achieved so much fame, when we had been carried in triumph somewhere for doing something great and good, when we had won an honored and ennobled name and arrived and were received at home in a shower of tears and joy. Is it possible that that Christmas has not come yet? And is our life here, at the best, so constituted that pausing as we advanced at such a noticeable milestone in the track as this great birthday, we look back on the things that never were, as naturally and full as gravely as on the things that have been and are gone, or have been and still are. If it be so, and so it seems to be, must we come to the conclusion that life is little better than a dream, and little worth the loves and strivings that we crowd into? No, far be such miscalled philosophy from us, dear reader, on Christmas Day. Nearer and closer to our hearts be the Christmas spirit, which is the spirit of active usefulness, perseverance, cheerful discharge of duty, kindness and forbearance. It is in the last virtues especially that we are, or should be, strengthened by the unaccompanied vision of our youth. For who shall say that they are not our teachers to deal gently even with the impalpable nothings of the earth. 
Therefore, as we grow older, let us be more thankful that the circle of our Christmas associations and of the lessons that they bring expands. Let us welcome every one of them and summon them to take their places by the Christmas hearth. Welcome old aspirations, glittering creatures of an ardent fancy and to your shelter underneath the holly. We know you and have not outlived you yet. Welcome old projects and old loves, however fleeting, to your nooks among the steadier lights that burn around us. Welcome all that was ever real to our hearts and for the earnestness that made you real, thanks to heaven. Do we build no Christmas castles in the clouds now? Let our thoughts, fluttering like butterflies among these flowers of children, bear witness. Before this boy, there stretches out a future, brighter than we ever looked on in our old romantic time, but bright with honour and with truth. Around this little head on which the sunny curls lie heaped, the graces sport as prettily, as airily, as when there was no scythe within the reach of time to shear away the curls of our first love. Upon another girl's face near it, placider but smiling bright, a quiet and contented little face, we see home fairly written, shining from the words as rays shine from a star, we see how when our graves are old, other hopes than ours are young, other hearts than ours are moved, other ways are smoothed. How other happiness blooms, ripens and decays. No, not decays, for other homes and other bands of children, not yet in being, nor for ages yet to be, arise and bloom and ripen to the end of all. Welcome everything. Welcome alike what has been and what never was and what we hope may be to your shelter underneath the holly, to your places around the Christmas fire where what is sits open-hearted. In yonder shadow do we see obtruding furtively upon the blaze an enemy's face. By Christmas day we do forgive him. If the injury he has done us may admit of such companionship, let him come here and take his place. If otherwise, unhappily, let him go hence, assured that we will never injure nor accuse him. On this day we shut out nothing.
Claus remained at his workbench, but he whistled and sang as merrily as ever, for he would allow no disappointment to sour his temper or make him unhappy. One bright morning, he looked from his window and saw two of the deer he had known in the forest walking toward his house. Claus was surprised. Not that the friendly deer should visit him, but they walked on the surface of the snow as easily as if it were solid ground, notwithstanding the fact that throughout the valley the snow lay many feet deep. He had walked out of his house a day or two before and had sunk to his armpits in a drift. So when the deer came near, he opened the door and called to them. Good morning, Flossie. Tell me, how are you able to walk on the snow so easily? It is frozen hard, answered Flossie. The Frost King has breathed on it, said Glossie, coming up, and the surface is now as solid as ice. Perhaps, remarked Claus thoughtfully, I might now carry my pack of toys to the children. Is it a long journey? asked Flossie. Yes, it will take many days, for the pack is heavy, answered Claus. Then the snow would melt before you could get back, said the deer. You must wait until spring, Claus. Claus sighed. Had I your feet, said he, I could make the journey in a day. But you have not, returned Glossy, looking at his own slender legs with pride. Perhaps I could ride upon your back, Claus ventured to remark after a pause. Oh no, our backs are not strong enough to bear your weight, said Flossie decidedly. But if you had a sledge and could harness us to it, we might draw you easily and your pack as well. I'll make a sledge, exclaimed Claus. Will you agree to draw me if I do? Well, replied Flossie, we must first go and ask the Knooks, who are our guardians, for permission. But if they consent, and you can make a sledge and harness, we will gladly assist you. Then go at once, cried Claus eagerly. I am sure the friendly Knooks will give their consent, and by the time you are back, I shall be ready to harness you to my sledge. Flossie and Glossy, being dear of much intelligence, had long wished to see the great world, so they gladly ran over the frozen snow to ask the Canucks if they might carry Claus on his journey. Meantime, the toy maker hurriedly began the construction of a sledge using material from his woodpile. He made two long runners that turned upward at the front ends and across these nailed short boards to make a platform. It was soon completed but was as rude in appearance as it is possible for a sledge to be. The harness was more difficult to prepare, but Claus twisted strong cords together and knotted them so they would fit around the necks of the deer in the shape of a collar. From these ran other cords to fasten the deer to the front of the sledge. Before the work was completed, Glossy and Flossy were back from the forest having been granted permission by Will Knook to make the journey with Claus, provided they would return to Bursey by daybreak the next morning. That is not a very long time, said Flossie, but we are swift and strong, and if we get started by this evening, we can travel many miles during the night. Claus decided to make the attempt, so he hurried on his preparations as fast as possible. After a time, he fastened the collars around the necks of his steeds and harnessed them to his rude sledge. Then he placed a stool on the little platform to serve as a seat and filled a sack with his prettiest toys. How do you intend to guide us? asked Glossy. We have never been out of the forest before, except to visit your house, so we shall not know the way. Claus thought about that for a moment. Then he brought more cords and fastened two of them to the spreading antlers of each deer, one on the right and the other on the left. Those will be my reins, said Claus, and when I pull them to the right or to the left, you must go in that direction. 
If I do not pull the reins at all, you may go straight ahead. Very well, answered Glossy and Flossy. And then they asked, are you ready? Claus seated himself upon the stool, placed the sack of toys at his feet, and then gathered up the reins. All ready, he shouted, away we go. The deer leaned forward, lifted their slender limbs, and the next moment away flew the sledge over the frozen snow. The swiftness of the motion surprised Claus, for in a few strides they were across the valley and gliding over the broad plain beyond. The day had melted into evening by the time they started, for swiftly as Claus had worked, many hours had been consumed in making his preparations. But the moon shone brightly to light their way, and Claus soon decided it was just as pleasant to travel by night as by day. The deer liked it better, for although they wished to see something of the world, they were timid about meeting men, and now all the dwellers in the towns and farmhouses were sound asleep and could not see them. Away and away they sped, on and on over the hills and through the valleys and across the plains until they reached a village where Claus had never been before. Here he called on them to stop, and they immediately obeyed. But a new difficulty now presented itself, for the people had locked their doors when they went to bed, and Claus found he could not enter the houses to leave his toys. I am afraid, my friends, we have made our journey for nothing, said he, for I shall be obliged to carry my playthings back home again without giving them to the children of this village. What's the matter? asked Flossie. The doors are locked, answered Claus, and I cannot get in. Glossie looked around at the houses. The snow was quite deep in that village, and just before them was a roof only a few feet above the sledge. A broad chimney, which seemed to Glossy big enough to admit claws, was at the peak of the roof. Why don't you climb down that chimney? asked Glossy. Claws looked at it.
they came from out the south, all dressed in ermine fine. They bore him gold and chrysoprase and gifts of precious wine. The shepherds came from out the north, their coats were brown and old. They brought him little newborn lambs, they had not any gold. The wise men came from out the east and they were wrapped in white. The star that led them all the way did glorify the night. The angels came from heaven high and they were clad with wings. And lo, they brought a joyful song the host of heaven sings. The kings, they knocked upon the door, the wise men entered in. The shepherds followed after them to hear the song begin. The angels sang through all the night until the rising sun, but little Jesus fell asleep before the song was done. <laughs> 